So let's go ahead and get started here into our discussion of chapter 12. So chapter 12 is really just kind of like the second half of the chapter 10. Uh, it, when we think about thermochemistry, what we really need to kind of remember is that it is one observation, one outlook at chemical reactions from a standpoint of does it occur or does it not occur? And so if we think about it in that way, the next approach to this thermodynamic puzzle is going to be the one that we are going to start looking at today. And it's going to focus on this kind of central question about something called a spontaneous process. So in thermochemistry, we didn't really talk too much about spontaneity. We didn't talk too much about whether a reaction was going to occur. We were just looking at what happens when this heat is generated or when, is, when it is um, absorbed. And so we do need to make a distinction here. Spontaneity concerns itself with the idea of the direction of a chemical reaction and the extent of a chemical reaction. In other words, which way is the reaction going to go? Is it going to be a forward-facing kind of chemical reaction where we get mostly products? Or is it going to be a backward-facing reaction where we get mostly reactants. And if you're hearing some of these terms and kind of cringing a little bit, yeah, I just talked about extent, forward reactions versus reverse reactions. So you kind of know what's coming at the end of this particular chapter. That equilibrium that we just put away is going to come back again but it's not going to be nearly to the same prominence or significance that we just departed from for the past three weeks or so. We'll be looking at it from a slightly different kind of point of view. But absent from this entire conversation is that kinetic discussion. We don't care at all about the speed of the reaction. That's a kinetics observation. That's a kinetic study. We want to know, does it happen? Not how fast does it happen? What direction does it happen? And so when we talk about something being spontaneous, we need to think of it in terms of its thermodynamic definition. Spontaneity is not what we kind of refer to as like randomness or... Um, this kind of outlook of you know, just you know, quirkiness or any other kind of adjective we might associate with a person who is described as being spontaneous. What we're thinking here in spontaneity is can this chemical process, can this physical process occur without outside interference? And I need to put a little pin on what that term outside interference is. You all have luckily gone through kinetics. So I don't need to explain to you the idea of activation energy. Activation energy is not the same thing as outside interference. Outside interference re refers to a continual input of energy to get the reaction to perform. If you go into the laboratory and you open up the gas line and you do nothing else, the gas inside of that burner is never going to light. Room temperature lacks the activation energy necessary to get that reaction to start 
between the oxygen and the methane. But you introduce a match to that burner that provides just enough activation energy to get the whole thing started, that burner will go forever until we run out of methane, at least. That's a spontaneous process. Once we introduce that little bit of activation energy, the reaction runs and it runs till its natural end point. Something that has a non-spontaneous process would require a continual input of energy to keep it where it is. Take, for example, this cup of coffee. When I bought it this morning, it was hot. It's not going to stay hot unless I put it on a heat source and continue to provide it with energy to keep it at that temperature. Otherwise, it's going to maintain, it is going to achieve some level of thermal equilibrium with this room. Eventually, it's going to get down to room temperature. So the spontaneous process is the cooling of this coffee. It will happen on its own without any outside interference. The outside interference I could put into it I could pour this into some sort of a mug, put it on a hot plate, keep it warm the entire time. That constant input of energy from that hot plate would keep it at that state that I'm interested in. Spontaneous processes are unidirectional. They only happen in one direction. There is no equilibrium associated the spontaneous process. Now they might end at an equilibrium point, very similar to my coffee example. This coffee will reach a thermal equilibrium state with the room. But for as long as the process of heat transfer is taking place, it's going to be one directional. Heat is going to come out of this cup and into the open atmosphere. And so if we can identify a spontaneous process, we can also define a non-spontaneous process as simply being the reverse reaction, the reverse process of whatever it is that we were observing. So I gave you an example with this coffee cup here. Here's some other examples. I have an egg and I drop it onto the floor. The spontaneous process would be that gravity acts on the egg, the egg hits the floor and it breaks. The non-spontaneous process would be that the egg basically picks itself up off of the floor, reattaches itself, and jumps back into my hand. There's also another term in there called reversibility, which obviously this one would not have. Once you break an egg, you can't put it back together. We can talk about things like expansion. Gases naturally expand to fill their containers. That's a spontaneous process. They mix together, spontaneous process. Getting them to unmix, that's a non-spontaneous process. Ice melting, spontaneous process if we're at a temperature above its melting point. But if we keep it at room temperature, for example, we're never gonna see that ice reform. It's gonna stay in the liquid state. 
Now, spontaneous and non-spontaneous should not be confused with reversible and irreversible. As we saw in some of those processes in the previous slide, there are some processes, there are some things that are not reversible. You can't unbreak an egg. So if a process is reversible, what that means is that to get the system back to where it was, we just have to reverse engineer the conditions. So that ice that was in a cup and melted, well, if I reverse the process, take it, I took it out of the freezer, put it on the table. If I put it back into the freezer, it'll reverse itself. The liquid water will turn back into ice. That's a reversible process. But certain, part, certain things aren't reversible, aren't going to yield a change. I like that Bunsen burner in the lab. I can't simply turn the carbon dioxide and water that formed in that process back into methane and oxygen just by turning off the heat. That's the difference between reversible and irreversible. Reversible changes, all I need to do is withdraw, reverse, whatever it is that I did, and I can turn the product back into reactant. Now, we have another name for reversible processes. They're processes that are at equilibrium. Um, that's kind of the ultimate reversible process is the equilibrium condition. But most reactions don't participate in that kind of an idea. So let's just kind of check here and see if we get some of our new definitions here. I've got three sets of conditions, three sets of reactions. Tell me which one is spontaneous as it's written, which one is spontaneous in reverse. All right, let's see how we did. So water getting hotter when we put a hot piece of metal into it, that seems like that's exactly what should happen. And it is. We would call that one spontaneous as written. Water at room temperature decomposing into hydrogen and oxygen. Well, I know it would evaporate. Would it actually decompose? When water evaporates, it doesn't change anything other than its phase. It's still water. It's still H2O. So no, that's not decomposition. That's just a, that's just a phase change. What about the reverse? If I have hydrogen and oxygen, would I be able to burn them to make water? Oh yeah, yeah. So that's a reverse. We're talking about a reverse process there. Benzene at its boiling point condensing. If we're at the normal boiling point and atmospheric pressure, that's an equilibrium process. Phase changes are equilibrium processes as we talked about in thermochemistry. So long as we are changing phase and we are maintaining that constant temperature, that's an equilibrium condition. 
It's only once we completely convert it to one side or the other that we actually start to see temperature changes happen. All right, any questions with that one? So thus far, we haven't really talked a whole lot about spontaneity, but the only frame of reference we've had for spontaneity has been enthalpy. And what we've noted just observationally is that most of the time when things are exothermic, they're also spontaneous. If you go through most of the examples that we looked at, almost all of them had delta H values that were negative. You do look at everything that we did in the lab, all of those had negative delta H values when we were looking at it from the reaction perspective. There's something to that. But it's not the whole story because we could point to certain processes that are endothermic in nature and yet are still spontaneous. Like, for example, ice melting. Take an ice cube out of the freezer, put it on the table. It'll melt spontaneously on its own. And that's an endothermic process because we have to warm the ice up to room to its melting point. We have to melt the stuff, which requires energy. And then eventually it reaches thermal, thermal equilibrium with the room. All that stuff is energy input. And yet it is still spontaneous. So enthalpy alone isn't going to tell us whether or not a reaction occurs. I'm going to need something else, an additional set of criteria. Here's another example, a cold pack. Um, cold packs contain usually some sort of ammonium salt compound in them. And the reason why is the heat of solution for those ammonium compounds is always endothermic which is why they make great ice packs because you break the seal, the stuff, the stuff makes kind of a slush in the water, immediately drops the temperature. You put that on an affected area, you put that on a sprain, it immediately cools things down. What the slide shows us is that there's something else that is going on in these kinds of reactions. It has to do with something called freedom of motion. In the ice pack, we started with a very compact array of these ions in this crystalline solid. And when we broke the barrier between the aqueous layer and the salt layer, they now form this solution. And in this solution, we can see there's a lot more space in between those ions and each other. So maybe this has something to do with the spontaneity at peace. This is something we haven't talked about before, but maybe there is something to this idea of a freedom of motion or spreading out the molecules. And what it happens to be is something called entropy. So entropy is another piece of the puzzle that we didn't have before, but when it comes to kind of building this overall picture of spontaneity, we cannot accurately portray spontaneity without discussing entropy in some kind of way. Now, you'll see entropy devised in a lot of different ways. And one of the reasons why 
is because entropy can kind of be hard to get your head around. Because what we're really talking about is at the molecular level. And visualizing the molecular level is hard because we can't see it. And so we try to construct models. We try to construct, you know, different visual pictures to try to explain what is happening in that molecular world. So one of the definitions of entropy is something that is related to what we would call randomness the randomness of a system, how disordered or disorganized a particular system is. And this definition works pretty well. It can help us to explain why there is greater disorganization in a solution compared to in a solid. Because I can look at things and say, okay, you know, solid, all those ions, all those molecules, whatever makes up that solid, they have to be really, really organized. They have to be arrayed really, really close together because they're all packed up real close. That's what makes a solid a solid. It's high density. And if I spread it out to the liquid phase, I can see that there's more ways for those ions, those atoms, those molecules to kind of arrange themselves differently. But it's kind of an incomplete picture because what if we're looking at two liquids? How can I assess the randomness of a liquid compound like benzene versus a liquid compound like water. They're both liquids. I have to have something else to look at. And one of those other definitions has to do with energy. And this is ultimately why entropy is part of thermodynamics. Because when we talk about entropy, from a pure thermodynamic standpoint, what we are talking about is how many ways, how many different ways can I distribute a piece of energy to this system? How many different ways can it use that energy? Now, what we will see is that enthalpy and entropy are both path independent. So what that means for us is that a lot of the kinds of things that we applied to enthalpy we can apply to entropy as well. So there is an entropy version of Hess's law. We're not going to use it because for the most part, Hess's law is, you know, adding together all those equations really doesn't do us a whole lot of good for entropy. But there's also a version of that heat of formation, products minus reactants that we can use for entropy and that we will use because those entropy values are well known. They're the last column of this uh, thermodynamic table that we gave you. The last column of the thermodynamic table in your book as well. So we'll get there in a minute. But understand, a lot of the things that we did with enthalpy, we're going to get to do with entropy as well. But before we do that, we kind of got to get our head around what entropy is and how we can use it and what kinds of ideas are governed by entropy. And this brings us to the second law of thermodynamics. Now, we remember the first law. That was what we covered last week. The law of conservation of energy. Energy cannot be created or destroyed in any process. Well, the second law of thermodynamics has a lot of complicated language in it. It says, any irreversible process will increase in the entropy of the universe. 
if the process is reversible, delta S is equal to zero as well. There's a simple way of explaining that. If we are looking at a spontaneous process, the entropy of the universe is increasing. That's what makes a process spontaneous. The entropy of the universe is increasing in that process. Now, remember, the universe consists of system and surroundings. So we're not necessarily just looking at the entropy of the system there. And that's where it can get complicated for us. And we'll actually deal with that complication tomorrow when we look at free energy, which will allow us to just focus on the system and forget all of the surrounding stuff. Which will actually simplify things a lot for us. But I want you to just kind of put your head around the idea of entropy. What this is saying is that in a spontaneous process, the entropy of the universe is increasing. Well, if we think about entropy as disorder, how many of you at home have a junk drawer? How many of you at home have a place where you put the mail and that place which started as just a little corner of one table has taken over half of your counter space. Okay. Some people know exactly what I'm talking about. You know that I know exactly what I'm talking about. This desk was clean at one point in time. Over the course of the past four weeks, it is a mess of all of my papers and things as we've gone through this semester. That is a spontaneous process. I did nothing to help it. Now to reverse it, I would have to put in work. I would have to take the time and get my papers collected, start organizing things, get it back to the way that it was. But the moment I stopped doing that, disorder would kind of take over again. That's entropy. That's reality. Now, how do we apply this to chemistry? Well, to apply it to chemistry, we have to go beyond just kind of these simple examples. We need to think about things on the molecular scale. And that's where this guy comes in. This is Ludwig Boltzmann. He is largely credited with describing the concept of entropy at the molecular level. And the reason why you see this bust of this man with an equation above his head is because he died before the scientific community accepted his ideas. That bust, that headstone, that's him. So confident he was that he was correct, that he immortalized himself with his equation on his gravestone and basically said, y'all be back. I'm right. I know I'm right. You'll come back to me. And sure enough, enough time passed that the concept of statistical entropy eventually gained enough hold. We still refer to Ludwig Boltzmann, but in his day, he wasn't exactly well regarded. So what did he say? Well, what he focused on was the idea that when we introduce energy to a system, and temperature is just a measurement of that internal energy, when we change that energy, there are a number of different ways that that energy can be manifested. Now, thus far, 
we've talked a lot about translational energy. That idea that when we raise the temperature of something, the molecules move around faster. But what Boltzmann suggested was that, well, yes, that is one kind of motion. But there have to be others. And these kinds of motions specifically relate to substances that have bonds, molecules. So vibrational modes. What we're talking about there is, think about the bonds that make up a molecule like springs. When I introduce energy to them, the spring will expand and contract. That's called a vibrational mode. We can also see rotational modes where we can see the molecule itself rotating on an axis or the bond simply rotating itself. And so those are all additional kinds of ways that energy can be utilized by a molecule. It's not just that the molecule flies across the room. It can. But we have to introduce the idea that those bonds are capable of absorbing that energy as well. And this knowledge of vibrational and rotational movement later becomes some of the ways that we can identify molecules and the way that things are put together um, from a spectroscopic kind of idea. So vibrational infrared. Infrared light is able to cause um, the bonds in a molecule to vibrate a particular frequency. And we can detect that frequency using a detector. And that can be one of the ways that we can kind of characterize a molecule. For those of you that go into organic chemistry, that is one of the first kinds of techniques that you end up using is you'll, you'll end up getting into that uh, IR kind of thing based on the vibrational modes. So what Boltzmann talked about, and this was kind of the controversial thing, is this idea of microstates. So let's say that we can take a picture of the molecules in the sample at any given moment of time. We would call that a microstate. So I've got this sample of carbon dioxide, and I can see that that molecule looks like this. This one's kind of stretched out. This one's turned 90 degrees. I can look at all of them in different kinds of ways. So that single picture would be a microstate. Now, what Boltzmann did with these microstates is he started to devise a way that we could count them, that we could try to figure out 
how many they have. So let's, let's take just a look at an example. We'll start with something simple. Let's say that we have two red marbles and two blue marbles that are divided by this, um, this plank here and half go on one side and half go the other. Well, we can see distinctly that there are six different ways that we could arrange those, those four marbles. They could go exactly as they are in this first one, where the red stay on the left and the blue stay on the right. They could reverse themselves like picture number six. Blue's on the left, red's on the right. And we can see that they can form various mixtures. And here we're talking about permutations where the order does matter. So red, blue, red, blue is different from blue, red, blue, red. But what we should notice is that on the extremes, those two configurations where they were completely separate from each other are half as likely as some form of mixing. And if we expand that, so that's a simple example. That's four molecules. What if we expand it to eight? Four of each kind. Well, this is just a subset of those, but what we can see in total is that there are only two arrangements where the two colors are completely separated. There would be 16 arrangements where one marble swap places. There would be 16 arrangements where three marbles swap places. And there'd be six ways where two were getting swapped. In total, there would be 70 unique arrangements. And so now you put that into your kind of understanding. 68 mixes versus two not mixes. As we get more and more and more and more and more molecules, the likelihood of getting completely separated states completely goes down, 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 down. The likelihood of getting some form of mixing goes up, 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 up. And so what this comes down to is that when we look at a particular thermodynamic state, we can say, okay, there is a certain number of microstates that are associated with this particular thermodynamic state. The number of microstates we are going to give by the variable capital W. And as you might imagine, if we have a sample that is bigger than eight molecules, this number is going to be large. The value of W is going to be significantly large. The Boltzmann constant is 1.38 times 10 negative 23rd joules per Kelvin. And if we take that constant and multiply it by the natural log of the number of microstates, that is going to give us the entropy of that system. And so as you might expect, the more microstates there are, the more entropy we're going to get. But notice one thing and one thing in particular. This value being a natural log 
this constant being positive there is no such thing as a negative entropy value there's no such thing as a negative entropy value it's always positive And if you look closely at your thermodynamic tables, what you will see is that entropy is in fact never zero either. And that gets into the third law of thermodynamics, which we'll talk about in a minute here. Now, just like with enthalpy, we are rarely concerned with the finite value of a system's unique entropy. Now, we can measure it. And in fact, you'll notice in the thermodynamic tables, the values that you have for entropy, there are not delta S's. They are actual entropy values that we can measure for a given system, a given substance, a given molecule at a particular state. But since we're most often dealing with spontaneous or non-spontaneous processes, we want to evaluate the change in that entropy. And to do that, we need to look at the change in the number of microstates. And so we start with this equation here where we subtract K times the natural log for the final minus K times the natural log for the initial. But what we can do off of that, we can apply a little bit of algebra, a little bit of trigonometry, use our logarithm rule the difference of logarithms is the same as the ratio of logarithms. So if I pull out that K value and take the ratio of those logs, I can get Delta S. Knowing what we know about logarithms, you know, Delta S can be negative because obviously entropy can go down or it can go up. And think about the, the desk situation here. If I put in the work, I can take this from a disorganized mess to an organized mess. And that would decrease the entropy on this desk. So it is possible to have a negative change in entropy, but it is not possible to have a negative entropy. Entropy is going to increase when the system's number of microstates increases as well. So if we start to look at this kind of holistically, we will notice that the number of microstates will increase. And because the number of microstates increases, the entropy will increase when we see the following kinds of changes. Increase in temperature. Increase the temperature. We're going to add more energy to the system. That can cause more microstates because we have more ways for that, that energy to be utilized. More rotational, more translational motion, more vibrational motion, those kinds of things. We can see increases with increases in volume. Increase the volume. Now you have more space to work in. And that's going to lead to more different kinds of variations, different combinations. Imagine that instead of having that little block that those marbles could go in, we change it into a cube. We change it into a large room 
a lot more ways for those to arrange themselves if they're not confined to those pegboards. And as we saw with the marbles example, when we increase the number of independently moving molecules, that increases the number of microstates in the entropy as well. Think about the difference between four marbles and six configurations versus eight marbles and 70 configurations. So, <clears throat> Drawing out some conclusions from this, we can look at entropy by the phase of matter and understanding that solids are going to have the most ordered kind of configurations and the least entropy as a result. Solids have the least degrees of freedom. They have the least range of motion. And as a result, you're not going to get as many microstates from mixing because all of those solids are going to be kind of confined to their given spots. Gases tend to have the greatest volumes, the greatest internal energies. And so as a result, they're going to have the greatest entropies as well. Most easily disordered phase. So if we've got solids on the one side, low, low, low entropy, and we've got gases on the other side, high, high, high entropy, liquids fall somewhere in the middle. Now, because of their condensed nature, there are times where they're going to kind of look more solid-ish. But depending upon what else is in there, if it's a pure liquid versus a solution, you know, solutions are going to have more disorder because we've got more independent molecules. Now, it's not going to reach anywhere near what a gas will be. But we can kind of see liquid is going to be a continuum between those two extremes. So... This brings us to the third law of thermodynamics. Third law of thermodynamics states a zero point. And the zero point on the entropy scale harkens back to something that we talked about at the very beginning of chemistry. Talked about the Kelvin scale, talked about what the zero point on the Kelvin scale was, absolute zero all molecular motion stops at absolute zero, right? Well, that's where this comes in. The third law of thermodynamics says that if we have a perfect crystal at absolute zero, its entropy would be zero. Now, the trick is, to get a perfect crystal and to get absolute zero. Both are kind of difficult. And so we can look, this is an example on the left of a perfect crystal. We can see that all of the bonds, all of the Hydrogen bonding, all of the intermolecular forces, they're all perfectly aligned with each other. Nothing is out of order. And in that circumstance, that would be an example of a perfect crystal that if we got it down to absolute zero, it would have zero entropy because there would be no disorder in it whatsoever. Because at absolute zero, we are supposed to have a complete lack of motion. So there goes your vibrational, there goes your rotational, there goes your um, translational motion. And we would also have perfect ordering. But notice, if we even have the slightest tweak in that, 
this slight little deviation from perfect arrangement would cause a slight little bit of rotational motion and that would negate the perfect nature of the crystal. That would negate its zero entropy. This, this has rotational motion. And so it's entropy even at absolute zero would be non-zero because it does have that rotational mode still available to it. Now, we have to understand that this is the height of theory because we've never actually witnessed absolute zero. But what we do know is that we do know that we can approach absolute zero and that there are some substances that just do not obey when it comes to how they arrange themselves as they approach absolute zero. And so that verifies, that validates what we say about the third law. Standard molar entropy is kind of on the same wavelength as heat of formation for enthalpy. Standard molar entropy is for entropy. Now, again, this isn't a formational value. We aren't getting this by getting other reactions. This is just a simple statement of the microstates that are in that solid, in that liquid, in that gas. But what standard molar entropy is, is the absolute entropy for one mole of a substance in that standard state. And standard states include these three that you know, solid, liquid, gas. But we're also going to throw into there the one molar solution. One molar solution is going to become a relevant measurement because, well, lots of things are solutions and they have entropy values with them as well. But notice the conditions here. The conditions here are different. We've talked about STP in the past. Standard temperature and pressure, one atmosphere of pressure, zero degrees Celsius, 273 Kelvin. Standard pressure and temperature, standard value, standard conditions are actually slightly different from this. Technically speaking, standard pressure is one bar. One bar is almost the same thing as one atmosphere slightly different. We're talking about just a little bit under one atmosphere of pressure. Temperature for standard conditions, 25 Celsius. What we're really talking about here is basically what we would consider normal room temperature. If we look at normal room temperature, normal room pressure, this is what we are going to get most of the time. Because unless you are at sea level doing your chemistry on the beach, chances are you are at some kind of elevation. Even here in the Wabash Valley, we are still maybe a couple of hundred feet above sea level. And when we measure our atmosphere pressure, we don't get one atmosphere. We don't get 760 millimeters of mercury. We get something in the 750s, high 740s most of the time. Now, does this make a huge difference in our calculations? Not really. If you use one atmosphere of pressure instead of one bar for your calculations, it's not going to make that big of a difference. 
but it might be enough that your homework raises a little bit of a red flag. So just be aware of that. Temperature is definitely different though. 273 versus 298, it's enough to notice. Now, qualitatively, we can look at our standard molar entropy values and we can start to notice some trends in standard molar entropy that are useful to us from a qualitative kind of standpoint where I can look at, okay, here's my molecule, here's another molecule. This one's gonna have greater entropy because of this. And so here are some of the things that we want to look at. Molecular size, molar mass. Now we, we, we took a look at this in chapter six. We were looking at intermolecular forces and, and ranking things like um, London dispersion forces. Increases in molecular complexity, molecular size, are going to come with increases in entropy. So as we go from methane to ethane to propane to butane, we will see that as we add that extra carbon onto the chain, our entropy values are getting bigger as we go. Most of that has to do with, again, those other modes of motion. When we add on a new series of bonds, we are going to add translational, vibrational, rotational energy. And that's going to increase the number of microstates, increase the, no the amount of entropy. But we also have to look at structural kinds of things as well. These two molecules on the bottom here have the same chemical formula. They're both C8H18. The difference is how they are arranged. Octane has put them into more of the traditional eight carbon chain, whereas tetramethylbutane has rearranged those eight carbons and kind of stacked them on top of each other. The long chain is going to have more rotational and vibrational degrees of freedom. And as a result, a higher entropy than the one that's got all the ones kind of stacked on top of each other. What we'll actually see is that three-dimensionally, those molecules, because they are kind of in close proximity to each other, they're going to be kind of limited in how much they rotate because they're going to start bumping into each other. And, so, and since they don't want to bump into each other and they can't bump into each other, they just don't exhibit as many of those modes. And that drops their entropy. So we know that entropy can vary by phase. We know that we can vary by molecular shape and structure. And this kind of points in the same direction as well. Here we have two allotropes of carbon. One is extremely rigid, the diamond. One is a lot more loose. We've got these planes of these um, sheets of these molecules and they can kind of slide over each other. And uh, it's hard to see from the picture. But we can see that there's actually a difference between them in terms of of uh, separation, the two carbons here, 
are separated by 154 picometers. These two carbon sheets are separated by 335 picometers. That variability in distance is going to create more entropy. And so what we'll see is that the graphite has slightly more entropy than the diamond. Even though both are solid, the graphite has slightly more entropy, which is also why graphite tends to be the more favored configuration at room temperature compared to the diamond. All right, let's take a look at some examples here. Should an entropy change be positive or negative based on these processes? So if we take a look at this first one. I've got two gas phase molecules turning into a solid. Which side of the equation has more entropy, the reactants or the products? Definitely. This is a reactants thing. We've got gases as reactants, which are highly disordered. Solid as a product. So we would expect our delta S value to be negative here. We've got sucrose dissolving in water. So going from the solid phase to the aqueous phase, what would we expect here? So here we would expect a positive change in entropy because we're going from that rigid solid to now we've got more room to distribute inside of that solution. In this third one, we've got hydrogen gas and oxygen gas turning into water in the gas phase. So we can't just simply use phase to figure this out. Because it's gases on both sides. So what we need to go to is amount, number of particles, number of gas particles in particular. We've got two gas molecules on the, on the product side. Two plus one equals three on the reactant side. So our reactant side has more gas molecules, more disorder than our product side. We would expect a decrease in entropy there. All right, any questions with this example? All right, in this question, we are just looking for which ones are gonna have a positive change in entropy. So select all the ones that would have a positive entropy change. All right, let's see how we did. All right, so the first one, we've got liquid water turning into a gas. Gases have more entropy than liquids, so that one would be positive. In the second one, we've got aqueous substances, which have some disorder, turning into a solid, which has very little. So that would be going the wrong direction. In the third one, we've got some solid and some gas turning into a solid. So um, the way I always look at these is 
I kind of look at it from what's your most, what side has the most entropy and what's happening to it. Um, so I can see that I've got gases on the reactant side. They're turning into solids. That's going to be a negative change in entropy. And then letter D here is a lot like the last one that we did in the example. We've got gas on both sides, but I've got three on the reactant versus two on the product side. So that one's not going to be positive either. So overall, we all got it. Only that first one would be positive. Any questions with this? All right. So we just want to finish up today looking at some of the more calculation y calculations associated with entropy. And so we come back to this idea of the second law. Second law says that if a process is spontaneous, the entropy of the universe has to be increasing, has to be greater than zero. And we know that we need to break universe up into the system and the surroundings. And so thus far, you know, the kinds of applications that we just did are really good at doing the, the entropy change of the system. I look at a chemical process, I can say, okay, it looks like the entropy is increasing. That's a good thing. What do I do about that surroundings piece? How do I evaluate the entropy of the surroundings so that I can get this complete picture? And there's a couple of ways that we can go about doing it. One of the ways is we can start looking, and this is, this is a heat flow kind of question if we are dealing with a reversible process, which is very few, there are very few reversible processes. Um, but if we had the heat change associated with say, boiling or freezing or melting, we could get the heat change we could divide it by the temperature that that heat change is occurring at, because again, it's a reversible process. And that would give us the entropy value, the change in entropy. But again, the problem here is that this is still system focused. If I'm looking at the melting point of benzene, that's still a system focused approach. How much heat do I need to put into the benzene to melt it? Divided by the temperature that I melted it at would give us the entropy change. And obviously if it's an endothermic process, we're gonna see a net increase in entropy because we're adding disorder to the system by adding energy to the system. And if it was an exothermic process, delta S would be negative because we're taking heat out of it. So we still really haven't answered the question. All we've done is come up with another way of, of devising entropy change. What else do we have? Well, let's come back to this. Well, we can use standard molar entropies. And like I said, if this equation here looks familiar, 
is because it's essentially the same equation we use for heats of formation in thermochemistry to find delta H. The only difference is that we're substituting out heat of formation for standard molar entropy. So we now have two ways of quantitatively determining the change in entropy. If it's a reversible process, we can use the equation that we just saw. If it's not a reversible process, we can use standard molar entropies to do products minus reactants and get us a delta S for the reaction anyway. Where does that delta S of the surroundings come from? Well, one way to do it is by looking at the heat of the system. I can calculate the heat, or excuse me, I can calculate the uh, entropy of the surroundings by taking the opposite of the heat of the system and dividing it by the Kelvin temperature. But there can be some problems with that too. What if our experiments like that calorimetry experiment and we end up not having a consistent temperature, but rather a change in temperature? I mean, yeah, this would work good for those reversible reactions where we're at an isothermic kind of set of conditions, but that equation looks awfully similar to the equation that we just saw. And that's because it is specifically designed. Because for a reversible process, delta S of the system and delta S of the surroundings should be equal and opposite. Because for a reversible system, delta S is equal to zero. Delta S of the universe, that is. Because it's not a spontaneous or a non-spontaneous process. It's a reversible process. So we're going to have trouble with this equation because most of the time when we are measuring the heat of reaction, that temperature value is not going to be consistent. Now, if we happen to have a situation where it is, then yeah, we could use this equation. And in your homework, you'll probably see a couple of examples of just that situation. But what we're going to find is that in an experimental sense, this is going to be a little bit difficult to, to work around and work with. Now, what this kind of thing can do is it can give us some information that can prove certain processes are spontaneous or non-spontaneous. So for example, if we have ice melting at room temperature, the entropy change for the system is here, 22, kilo, or 22 joules per Kelvin. And the change for the surroundings is only negative 20.4 joules. If I add those together, I get positive 1.6 joules per Kelvin, which would indicate that ice melting at room temperature would be a spontaneous process. And the reason it would be a spontaneous process is because we are not at 
the melting point, we are in fact above the melting point. If we are at the melting point, those two would be exactly even. They'd be canceling each other out because of that, that condition. So let's end with a couple of examples. Uh, let's go back. All right, let's try this again. What is the value of the, enthalpy, or the entropy change when 60 grams of liquid mercury vaporizes at its normal boiling point of 356.7 degrees Celsius? So again, the easiest way to do this is using the delta S values, the reversible heat change divided by the temperature. Um, for the reversible heat change, we would just use the enthalpy of formation. So the um, formation value of enthalpy for gas is 61.36 um, kilojoules. Per mole um, minus the heat of formation for the mercury in the liquid phase, which should be zero, and it is because that is the natural state of mercury. So you have in the numerator of this fraction 61.36 kilojoules per mole. Temperature value, um, 356.7 degrees Celsius plus 273.15 makes um, 629.9 Kelvin. And so if we take those values by each other, we would get 0 0.09741 kilojoules per mole. Kelvin. Now, as you might expect, kilojoules tend not to be the unit for entropy values. And if you look closely, they say um, joules per mole Kelvin. And the reason is kind of obvious here. Entropy values tend to be on the smaller side. So if I multiply this out, one kilojoule is a thousand joules. I get 97.41 joules per mole Kelvin. Now the question is, what is the value with 60 grams of the stuff? So that would be the last piece of this, 60.0 grams of mercury. Molar mass of mercury is 200.59. 
So if I take that 60, divide by 200.59, I get 0.299 moles, which I can then multiply by 97.41 joules per mole Kelvin. Moles would cancel. I get 29.1 joules per Kelvin. Now, like I said, you could estimate this also using the standard molar entropies. And if you did that, um, at least according to the, the text, the numbers here in, in our uh, packet, the gas would be 173.7 and subtract from that 76.0 for the liquid. You would get 97.7 joules per Kelvin instead of 97.41. Um, one of the reasons for that difference is the temperature difference. Um, measuring this at um, 356.7 degrees instead of, two, instead of 25 degrees would make a slight variation on the entropy. Um, but as you can see here, not that significant um, relatively speaking. So um, we generally assume that even though these values are set at 298 Kelvin, we generally assume that delta H and delta S do not really vary too significantly with temperature unless we are told otherwise. So even if we're told, hey, this reaction is being done at 500 Kelvin, this is being done at 2000 Kelvin, we can use these delta H and standard molar entropy values just the same. And most of the time they work pretty well for us. All right, convoluted first 10 and a half minutes of that question aside, questions. So if I take 356.7 degrees Celsius and add 273.15 to that, I get 629.9. The all of anytime we see temperature in a thermodynamic equation, it has to be Kelvin. So if the reaction is done at standard conditions, then we would use 298. Since this particular reaction was not done at standard conditions, this was done at the boiling point, we would have to use that value. So that would have come from the thermodynamic table values, the heats of formation. So I pulled the heat of formation for mercury in the gas phase. That was the product minus the liquid phase. That was the reactant. And so I just pulled those values directly off of the thermodynamic tables here. All right, any other questions with this example? All right, let's document that for posterity.
And let's take a look at one more example. This one will go a lot easier because I didn't screw up nearly as badly. Um, we're just going to use standard molar entropy values here. So here we've got a steam forming uh, reaction uh, where we're going to crack methanol with steam to create carbon dioxide and hydrogen. This is a common way that we actually get hydrogen for fuel cells. What we want is the entropy change for the reaction. And we're going to do it using the same kind of technique that we saw with heats of formation. We're looking at standard molar entropy change for the products minus standard molar entropy change for the reactants. Now, one thing that is going to be different here, there aren't going to be any zero values. So if you got used to kind of skipping elements because they are in their standard states and formations, can't do that here. But we're going to take the standard molar entropy for carbon dioxide, add that to three times the standard molar entropy for hydrogen. And we're going to subtract from that the sum of the standard molar entropy for methanol and steam. Now, once again, get the phases here do make a difference. So when we're pulling these off of the tables, make sure that we grab the right ones. For carbon dioxide, that one shouldn't be hard. Um, we really only know carbon dioxide in the gas phase. So the standard molar entropy for carbon dioxide is 214. joules per Kelvin. For hydrogen, again, this one's going to be non-zero because um, everything has an entropy. It's 131 joules per Kelvin for hydrogen. For methanol, CH3OH in the gas phase, not the liquid phase, is 240. And for water in the gas phase, it's 189. So if I put the products together, 214 plus three times 131 is 607 joules per Kelvin. On the reactant side, 240 plus 189 is 429 joules per Kelvin. And so our Change in entropy, 607 minus 429 would be 178 joules per Kelvin. And this is about what we, we expect, not in terms of the number itself, but in terms of its sign. We're going from two reactant gas molecules to four reactant gas molecules. So the increase in the number of gas molecules should yield a positive entropy. And 
It does. So that's going to close it up for entropy for today. And so 